Oh my god, I'm really happy to win something with Sinta Okay, and I appreciate it too Because it's like 7 months going right now Since the first day on the list And the internet and now we're playing on the video First that's the thing Anyway, let me get started <coughs> So, what's up everyone, welcome back Oh sure, I can't tell that So today we are having an interview with Mark Mitz Africa Don't ask yourself who is Mark Mitz Africa Because that's what we're having today That's the person that we're having today and there is a lot to talk about Mark Matsaka. If you don't know him, don't worry. We have a lot of content coming up. And let me introduce you to him. Hey, can you say something? Who are you and what you like? Who is Mark? <laughs> okay, uh, my name is Mark Dell. I came to Tanzania three years ago and I've been here ever since. I do travel a bit, but Tanzania is the country I spend the most time in. So it was my first and it seems to be the one I can't leave. <laughs> So, why exactly did you first have Mark Meets Africa on your channel? Uh, the goal when I started Mark Meets Africa was to travel around Africa. Mark Meets Africa doesn't actually stop at Africa though. The goal was to meet melanated people all around the world. You know, there's black people everywhere. There's Africans everywhere. So even if I went to China, the goal was to find Africans in China and meet them. So that way I left it open to be anywhere. I just want to travel. And uh, yeah, so Mark okay. Meets Africa. Uh, I just put this question right now, you're saying, I'm not sure if you're going. If you're going to talk to us, it's okay, we can just ship in. But if you're not, then we we'll just cut it off. So like, uh, since you say that you are you're from which country, you tell them. I'm from the United States. Okay, so you're from the United States, and that keeps your currency a little bit high to spend it outside the country, right? Okay. So, how did you, what, what, what mechanisms, because a lot of people, I'm sure, even those that are watching, they would really wish to do the same travel, but one of the problems that they have is finance, like financial issues. So they will say, like, I don't have enough money, but how did you come around and think of maybe I'm going outside the country? Okay, how am I going to manage yourself outside the country with the finances? Um, that one's a little bit of an iffy question, because to me it was like a, a leap of faith. On one hand, I knew I could adapt, but on the other hand, I didn't know what was here. So, so like on, on your side, <laughs> you gotta tell me like you you did like okay, in these coming years, I'm gonna work so hard in America, five years or two years, then all this capital or amount of money that I'm saving, I'm gonna go and explore the world. <laughs> no, I I came in a week. So like, okay, so what strategy did you have in mind? There was no real strategy. If I'm being, which sounds irresponsible, I know, but at the <laughs> time it was such a strong feeling to go. I just, within a week, I decided I'm leaving. And that was it. And but okay. At the moment before you left, that you had been working in the country, right? Yeah, of course. I've been doing my little online business and then, I don't know, I think, Really, the decision from when I wanted to go to Africa and when I actually went, it was legitimately about a week or two. It wasn't a year planning, it wasn't two years in the making. I always knew I wanted to travel. I didn't think I'd travel that soon. So, I want to say there was almost no planning, but there was. It was just over a shorter period of time. So during your stay in America, you never like watched people's videos on the way because I think the traveling system came around during 2015, 2012. There yeah, during that time, you weren't even checking why how people do travel and stuff. Maybe you thought of maybe I could learn from them so they would be traveling. Twenty fifteen. Yeah. No. Twenty fifteen. I was like fourteen years old. I was doing school. I I came over here. I did watch a few videos. Yeah in the Gambia, there was a channel called the Black Acres of the Gambia. I saw a few of their videos. I saw somebody in Ghana, I don't remember who, but I watched a few videos and came over. It wasn't extensive though. I know, I know it sounds terrible. <laughs> Looking back on it, what a decision. Because it really was based on how I felt at the time. I just had something really strong told me, go to Africa. I wasn't into the whole pan-Africanism, black empowerment at all, really, before I came. I just 
something said come, and I came. And three years later, I'm still here. So I call it a good decision. But in the moment, <laughs> it was a bit, it was a risky. bit, yeah. Some people might call it risky. Others might call it irresponsible. But to be honest with you, it just felt right. And I don't regret it. So the other question, <clears throat> the other question uh, that I had is that you say Tanzania was the first choice that you came to Tanzania, right? So what was your intuition to that? Tanzania would be a good place to have it. Uh, it was South Africa. Tanzania was my third choice. <laughs> well, technically it was the fourth, but not because I went to another place first. Initially, I wanted to go to Ghana. <laughs> A few days after looking at Ghana, I saw the Gambia, and I said, it's the smiling coast of Africa. <laughs> I'm always smiling. So I wanted to go to the Gambia. When I booked my ticket, or when I was about to book my ticket, I had some Chrome notification pop up on my computer, and it said something about the Gambia had just closed its borders for 90 days. And I said, huh, I'm trying to leave <laughs> next week. <laughs> So I, I looked, and uh, obviously I couldn't buy the ticket because it was outside of my time frame. And so I said, you know what, what am I going to do? And something said, look to the east. So I looked at Kenya. <laughs> it was too, how do I put it? I looked at one picture of the capital city of Kenya, and I said, something about that city just looks too familiar. And I said, that's not the place. And so I looked just below it on the map, I saw Tanzania. I had never heard of Tanzania before seeing it on a map. And so I said, okay, Tanzania. I did go on YouTube and I saw a few videos on Tanzania. Tanzania, here I come. Yeah, I, I knew I wanted to go. And I said, you know, what? it's a place I hadn't really heard of, which means maybe it's not so well known. I wanted to go to a place where people weren't going to. Not on purpose, but just because I like being in new places and figuring out new things. And I guess, you know, that's one aspect of myself that I do miss. It's how comfortable I used to be with going to a place where I knew I wouldn't know anything or anyone. Especially a place with a language barrier like Tanzania. I said, you know what? That's the place. And so I booked a ticket to Tanzania. But you could have chosen Asia. You know, Asia looks like a little bit really less pricey and easy to travel around and get to Africa. Yeah, when I was younger, since like 12 years old, I had a, I have a list of countries I've always wanted to visit. And some of the first countries on that list are Asia, places in Asia, and India. Those are pretty high on my... Africa's way down below on that list. You still came to Africa right? first. What? Because the feeling told me to. Um, Against everything that I normally planned, or at least for my life, I knew I wanted to travel, didn't know when. I knew where for the most part, but I didn't exactly know when I would go to those places. I knew I wanted to go to Africa. I thought I'd go to Africa later in life. If I'm being honest with you, I thought it'd be late 20s or mid to late 20s before I ever came to Africa. Not because I didn't like Africa, just because I, I really thought I liked Asia and, and um, India. I thought those would be the places I went to first. I didn't know much about Africa. But something, I'm telling you, when I say this feeling was so strong, the way you're sitting here and we're having this conversation, that's how real the feeling felt. Still does. That feeling said, go to Africa. I was like, Africa? Of all places? <laughs> Start so pulling out the list. This isn't on the list until later. But I had to come. Because it's not a feeling that's ever misled me. It's never lied to me. So in my mind, it was what I had to do. So I'm here. And uh, as long as you've stayed here for three years, like, uh, you're already, are you already coping with the environment or still have some troubles? Um, I say my time here has been like this. Like, on one hand, I adjusted really quickly. On another hand, because of some things that have happened, I think it caused me to feel a certain way about the place and blocked a bit of how I used to be open to certain things. And I'm not going to call that a good thing. In fact, it's actually something I'm working on. This place hurt me in a way that I was not used to. 
You know, when you open your heart to a place and you give it everything you've got, you learn the language, you learn the culture. You know where I used to live, right? Yeah. Very local. I got all my mamas. I was the uncle in the neighborhood. I was the neighborhood friend and all this stuff, and I had no issues. And so it made it really easy for me to love this place. It made it easy for me to want to stay here and be here and see more and do more and really kind of become a part of the culture. And then when I started having issues that were like issues that Tanzanians face, I suppose, that kind of broke my heart, man. You know, it really messed me up for a minute because I said, this isn't right. I'm trying to do the best I can to be in a new place. I've given up my old ways as best I can. I've learned a new one, and I thought I dove in. That's what I kept on hearing from people. Oh, wow, how'd you learn the language? Wow, you're really local. Wow. You know, even at the immigration office, the guy asked me, do you want to be a citizen? That's how happy I was to be here. And it radiated off of me to the point where people could feel it. They said, this guy, he needs to be a Tanzanian. He's just like us, he's this and this, because I adapted the culture. I made the effort to adapt, and it wasn't hard when you're happy. But when I felt like maybe it wasn't reciprocate, you know when you love somebody and they don't love you, they don't reciprocate, you feel bad. You're not mad at them because you love them, but at the same time, you still feel upset that they don't feel the same. So on one hand, you're in a position where you can't exactly say it, but you have to feel it. So that's how I feel about Tanzania, or at least at the time, where I put my heart and soul into this place, and I felt like I got kicked in the heart. I'm serious. Okay. And that's hard to say as a man. You know, we're not talking about a relationship, but we are talking about a relationship with the place. Yeah. And that hurt the most. That This place messed me up, man, for, for, for a time. I was actually negative. I've never in my life been a negative person going all the way up to 19 years. I came here at 19 years old. I've never been a negative person. I've never been somebody who can wake up and say, I don't like this person, or, you know, I don't want to go outside. That didn't happen. That happened here. So it put myself, the shadow, if you will, in front of me. And I had a decision to make. And the decision was, do you want to be this way or this way? And I thought it was a silly question. The same voice that told me to come to Tanzania was asking me this question, and I was upset. Well, I said, the one that told you to come here. The same one. I said, no, why on earth would I come to a place just to get my heart broken? Why would I do that? And the answer was something along the lines of, when you go to a place, you see yourself sometimes. And I was presented with a choice. Do you want to dislike this place or not? And in my mind, I said, obviously nobody wants to dislike a place. Nobody wants to wake up angry. Nobody. And the voice was like, then don't. And I was like, how senseless, right? Because that's like how insensitive. The feeling I had was I had to be angry at what had happened to me here. I've been through issues after issue after issue here after being in a place where nothing bad ever happened in america nothing bad ever happened in the first nine months of being in tanzania nothing bad happened to me. but that thing happened to me and i was given the choice feel bad or don't i'm still kind of readjusting to be as positive as i used to be you know i've been to jail in this country Real? Because of somebody's okay, that's because of somebody's issue they were having with the person that had nothing to do with me, but because of you know how the system works, mm-hmm. I need money. I want re- it's yeah, the exactly. That's what hurt me. I said if I made the effort to become part of the family, to join the club, why would you treat me like I'm not a part of it? What helped me get out of that feeling was when I saw it happen to Tanzanians too. And I stopped feeling like it was personal. Because at first I took it personal. I said, you did that to me because I was a foreigner, because you don't actually see me as family. Then I saw some of the things that were happening to me, happening to Tanzanians. And I said, they just treat each other like that. Some people, not just Tanzanians, some people treat people that are from where they're from badly. It's the same in America. 
Some people are just like that. That's what helped me stop feeling so bad. Now I feel bad for the people that happens to myself included. Because I say that's unacceptable. How can you be in a place that's this toxic, not Tanzania, but in that situation and come out of it positive? So I had to adjust the way I saw the situation. Instead of seeing it like this happened to me, I now, now I see it as this happened so I could see me. And I could choose, do I want to be angry? Do I want to be sad? Do I want to have my heart broken? And it's a hard choice because obviously on one hand you don't, but on another hand you almost feel like you have to play those emotions out. In America, I could easily be a robotic person that understand principle, integrity, values, all that, and there was no wrong is wrong is wrong is wrong. Over here I had to adjust that. I said, but that's the fundamental of who I am. I was raised on integrity and principle. I was raised on right is right and wrong is wrong. Then I get here, fall in love with the place, and because I love the place, adjust how I see the place. And I said, that's not right. And then the same voice said, why is that not right? I said, it's not right because it's making me angry. He said, why are you angry? And I said, well, because they're doing this. Well, why are they doing this? And I had to question, why are they doing this? And I said, oh, if somebody can cheat you, lie to you, steal from you, it's because they're hurting too. And so I had to back up and say, oh, shoot, I'm feeling bad, but they're feeling bad. And I had to put my feeling aside and say, do I still want to be here? That voice, some people call it the ancestors. I got that a lot. Some people call it the Holy Spirit. Some say it's God. I don't really care what you call it. It's what it is for me. Same voice said, I wouldn't send you to a place just so you can fail. So I could have either chose to accept what had happened to me and say, F this place. And I would have been right because no one wants that to happen to them. I've talked to at least a hundred people in my three years here who have left because of what has happened to them. That's part of why I don't think it was personal because it was everybody was experiencing similar things. I had to back myself up and say, take it, take it, take it understand what it is and let it go and it's hard to let stuff go especially when you are hurting i tell you i've never heard it like i heard in tanzania never in my life have i experienced heartbreak to a place like in tanzania because this place felt like home it felt like family it felt like i was in the place that i had been born to be in when you can walk down the street and people can't tell where you're from then you open your mouth and they hear that you don't speak the language quite right, but they still accept you as family, that does something to a person, especially someone like a lot of African ancestral diaspora, whether they're from America, um, the Caribbean islands, not so much the Caribbean islands, but even they're experiencing it, the UK, Europe, wherever they come from. If we look like this, we typically have similar problems, even in the countries we're from. So when you get to a place where people treat you like family, you open up a lot. When you open your heart, you make room for an attack. And when you get attacked, some people shut their heart really quick and it becomes stone. There's people who left Tanzania with no more love. They came and they just barely had enough love left in their heart after all the years of abuse in their countries. They had barely enough love left to love one more time. And Tanzania, and not just Tanzania, it's happening in other African countries, kicked them in that heart. They don't have any more love left. Hearts of stone. Part of me doesn't want to defend them too much though because I was one of them. I said, you know what? I could harden my heart and never get hurt again. Be in a place where I'm okay, where I'm, you know, respected and dealt with with dignity and, you know, seen as family. And But then I said, you know what? That's not what life is about. Life is about doing for the people that need things done for them. Not coming to Tanzania, oh, you're poor, you need help. No, I see you're hurting. Rich, poor, this, that, that. You're suffering because you woke up today and said, I'm going to cheat you. I'm going to overcharge you for a ride. That's a person who's not honest. Why aren't they honest? Well, you can say they're greedy or you can say they're needy. So I have to constantly and on a daily basis readjust how I see Tanzania and Tanzanians. It's hard to do, especially with that heartbreak, because that's a wound that has healed, but it's still a scar.
And so I have to every day readjust how I see the place. Because if I don't, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to remember that trauma, remember that. I didn't have trauma in America. I had it here. <laughs> Most people have trauma there, then they get more here. So I was fortunate to have less trauma than most people. That's a blessing on me. Sorry to ramble for so no, long. Okay. Like, no, it's, it's okay. Like, uh, do you have anything else that uh, you could say on that, on that side, like what has really made you look happy? Well, <laughs> I could go on a long time about that, but wherever I go, that list would make sense. It's not just Tanzania. It's wherever you go, you're gonna have problems and there's gonna be solutions to the problem. Tanzania, again, made me upset, not because something happened to me in Tanzania that wouldn't happen to me anywhere else. No, it's because something happened to me from a place I love. That's how it works. I could care less if somebody treated me badly in America, a stranger, because I don't know them. But when you, again, open yourself up and love, I'm just gonna be honest, and you guys could, you know, call it what you want, but when you love someone or something or some place and that place hurts you, love turns into hatred. Yeah, that's true. For a very short time, I felt actual hatred towards this place. I said, nobody's ever treated me that bad. Nobody that I love has ever treated me that bad. Nobody that I intentionally made an effort to love has ever treated me that bad. I was so mad, I said, no, that's not right, that's evil. I started saying that, I said, that's evil. I said, that's wicked as heck. I've done nothing to these people. And it wasn't these people, Tanzanians, no, these people that were hurting me, these specific people. And I said, no, no, no. And then I started hearing it happen to other people and I started thinking, maybe that's just how it is. And I started getting into that thinking that makes you start to dislike a place more. And then I had to back up and say, no, they're just hurting. And uh, okay, okay. So you have talked about the part that made you like a little separate. So what's the good part that made you like? Oh, that's a long list. Too. <laughs> Tanzania was the first place I could probably feel like I had family walking around everywhere. Tanzania was that place for me. It was my first, if you will. And you know, the first is always a special. Yeah, one. It's true. always special. You make a lot of mistakes on your first, first kid, first love first relationship you make a lot of mistakes but it's also special because it's your first and that's what Tanzania felt like to me it was my first for a lot of things a lot of great experiences here first for a lot of things and I I love it for that I still remember because there's power in memories I remember the good I will not forget the good but you know Pain has a way of corrupting good memories. Yeah. So even now when I think back on some of those memories, I think, what, were they real? You know what I mean? Yeah. Not because I want to, but because that's how the heart works. I'm a human, sometimes I forget that. Especially with all the people that say, Mark, you're really strange. Sometimes I'll forget it. And it sounds strange saying that out loud, but I'm being completely honest with you. Sometimes I forget that I have a heart and that heart hurts, especially when you give it to someone. So. I'm gonna mention that a lot, man. Tanzania has a lot of good though. It, it it taught me a lot too. It taught me how to love and be happy and have peace even when I don't have it. When you're not giving it to me and I can't go outside and get it and I can't go to the store and get it and I can't call my friend and get it, do I still have it? And the answer is yes. But that's something I had to make sure of through the lessons that Tanzania taught me, which was you should have them regardless of who gives them to you. It's not the place, it's not the people, it's not the mentality, it's you. Sometimes you have to adjust your mind. I had to adjust my mind. And I'm not, I'm not saying nobody's wrong. There's a lot of wrong too. But I'm not saying that all of it's the reason I feel bad. No, some of it's me. Some of it is me. That's something I have to say too. And I have to let go of my desire to want those things, peace, love, and joy. How entitled is it to say that I'm owed peace and love and joy in my daily life? No, I have to bring those things with me wherever I go. So now when somebody overcharges me, instead of getting angry, I just say, you know what? Is this person worth my peace? The answer is no. Is it worth my joy? Is it worth my love? No. So I'm going to question them still because I stand on principle. I'm going to say, why are you really overcharging me? Did you make enough yesterday? 
did you eat today? And not in a way that makes the person feel bad. Not in a way that says, oh, you know what, you're poor. No, you don't rub a person in the wound that's hurting them. No, you ask him, what's going on, man? I'm a person too. Why are you doing this to me? Because again, hard not to take it personal, even though it's not. But sometimes it feels like it. So for the sake of my peace and my love and my joy, I ask. So now the Bajaji driver overcharged me. Why do you uh, overcharge me? You make enough yesterday? Everything going well in your life? Because I genuinely want to know so that I don't feel bad. So the other question is, uh, what are the differences that you have seen? <laughs> There's a few. <laughs> the difference is the difference between living in America and Tanzania. I mean, people are very curious. We should do like, you know, most of the Tanzanians they think that America is not a That's why most of the people are. Depends on what you look at. America is not So. Why do we see then Americans coming to Africa? If it's the land of opportunity, why are you running from the land of opportunity? Why we are craving so much to go to the land of opportunity? That's a good point. I think you made a very good point that a lot of people are afraid to talk about. Why, if our country is so great, would we come here? I think you're asking the right question to the right person. If you ask a white American this question, you get a different answer, 100%. African Americans ancestrally come from Africa. That's just a well-known fact, you know. It. It's obvious, if you can walk down the street and I can walk down the street and they can't tell that I'm not from here, that's a sign. African Americans on average come to Africa because they want to reconnect with their roots, not because they think Africa's better than America. They want to reconnect with the place they come from. We are a people whose history was taken from us. So we want to know where we come from. We want to feel like we're a part of a community that has our best interest in mind. That's why we come, a lot of us. Some of us, yes, it's economic. Some of us want a discount version of America. But a lot of us are coming because we want to be in a place with people who look like us. We want to see people who look like us. We want to have some sense of community. We want to be loved. We want to love. We want to treat people right. We want to feel like we're a part of something. That's why African Americans and diaspora from abroad, ancestral diaspora, as in our ancestors were taken from here. Why wouldn't we want to come back? That's the question. Why wouldn't you want to come back to Africa to see where your ancestors who suffered so much came from? Why wouldn't you want to come back? Why you would can, you want you, you to? You can come as a tourist and just spend some time in And a lot of people do. Because ancestrally, we have a right to Africa. Ancestrally, we have a right. Some people want to claim that right. And shouldn't they? If you have your mother and your grandmother, and then your grandmother dies and leaves you land, or has a desire for you to see land that she had for you, wouldn't you want to fulfill her request? Oh, so if our ancestors from 400 years ago had a desire that one day their great-great-grandchildren or their great-great-great-great-grandchildren could see the land they came from, wouldn't you want to fulfill their desires? So sometimes people come because they want to do justice to their ancestors. They say what happened in history was wrong, right? How do you fix something that was wrong? You can't undo it, but you can try to fix it. You can try to remedy it. Sometimes the solution is go back where you came from. Africa is a place we come from. If we want to come back, we should be able to. The problem is these countries didn't exist when we left. Tanzania is not that old. We left 400 years ago. And we don't have the same, yeah, we don't have the same mentality as our ancestors did, but we also don't have the same accessibility. Africa has been carved out and divided. You're Tanzanian, he's Kenyan, he's Nigerian, he's Somalian. Africans were divided amongst each other and pitted against one another. These countries didn't exist when we left. So now it's complicated coming back because you're not Tanzanian. You're not Tanzanian. 
You know what I mean? I get we can say the same thing, but most people are under a brainwashing that says, I'm a Tanzanian, or I'm a Ugandan, or I'm a Zambian, or I'm a... They were told that. Just like we were told we were something. And we're coming out of that. We're saying, no, we're not. We're what we want to be. The world is waking up to the idea that you can choose your destiny. If I choose to come back to Africa, then I'm choosing to reconnect with my ancestors' destiny. I'm choosing to undo in my own special way, though not through history, in my own way undo some of what happened to them and reconnect them to where they come from. That's what we're doing. It's a service to our ancestors. You guys respect your ancestors. So do we. We just have different ways of showing them. We don't always know that's what we're doing, but when we come to Africa, we are respecting our ancestors by paying homage to the place they come from and expressing a love in a place with so many opportunities, but also a lot of problems. When we come here and say, I want to live here, it's not because, oh, you know what? The roads are nice and the stores are nice and the houses are nice and everything is working. No, we come here because we see a problem and a lot of us say, this isn't what Africa should look like. My ancestors would not be proud to be here because this isn't what it looked like when they left and this isn't what it should look like now that we've come back. We're doing our ancestors a service. It has almost nothing to do with the modern African because the modern African is a design by the European. The modern African was designed in a room full of white men who had no interest in Africa nor its history, in a room full of white men, and they designed the African to be a certain way so they can consume, so they yeah. can produce, so that they can, you know, consume more. be extort, extort. That's the modern African. We don't like the modern African because the modern African doesn't recognize his ancestors. Because if you did, you'd see he was sitting right here. You'd see that we're all the same. You'd see that that Nigerian is your brother. You'd see that that Somalian is your brother or sister. You'd see that the person in Congo was the same as you. You wouldn't respect the borders given to you because they're not designed for you. They were designed for the production of goods and the division of labor. They were designed so that you could continue to serve Europe even when they left. And then they were given you they gave you pride to be what you were told to be. So now I'm proudly a Kenyan, but you're not a Kenyan. You were given that title and the border was drawn on a map with no consideration for the natural terrain, with no consideration for the tribes that remain there, with no consideration for the families you would be separating by dividing this imaginary line. There was no consideration given, which means you've accepted a system that does not apply to you. It's not right. When we come, we want to, deep down inside, every African diaspora, every ancestral African diaspora wants to undo that. Whether Africans do or not, we want to undo it. We don't like it. Sometimes we don't feel included in the discussion, though. A lot of people don't consider us African. They consider us Americans or Europeans or whatever. Mentality-wise, we can be, yes. But blood-wise, we're not. Sometimes we have to. I don't want to get into. It. <laughs> okay, no problem. I'm sorry, I'm rambling. It's okay. Thank you so much. And the other question was, uh, <clears throat> like, what's your long-term goal? My long-term goal is simple. It's just to expand what I'm doing, not just for Tanzania, but for all of Africa. My goal is to have a service called Merge. I have a company called Merge. The goal is to merge people back to where they came. It's, it's, it's in the name. I want there to be a system and service in place of every African country, an ancestral African diaspora chooses to come to, whether it's Tanzania or Rwanda, whether it's Kenya or Uganda, South Africa, Zambia, Congo. I want you to be able to pick up a phone, send an email, go on the website and say, I'm interested in going to blank. How do I make it there? And we have a whole step-by-step -step list. We have people to recommend. We have things that we can do for you while you're there. We have services that will make sure you're not taken advantage of. Make sure you don't experience what the founder, Mark, experienced and got his heart broken, but still had the strength to stay. Because most people leave. That's what I want Merge to be. I want it to be a service where nobody ever has to suffer what I suffered, or any of us suffered. 
I don't want a repeat of history where we feel like we don't belong anywhere. That's what merge is. It's a design that makes it so we can come back without disrupting too much of the country while also still feeling like we have a place to call home. It's basically trying to get two halves to come back together. Africans are that one half and we are the other. We should be together. It's simple as that. Anybody in the world can look at you and me, whether we go to China or Europe or whatever, and we'll be treated the same until we open our mouth. So if we have that level of issue, then we should have a solution that both of us come up with. Until the image of African globally, until the image of Africans all around the world rises, none of us will. Right now, if you think of Africa, you think of poverty, dirt, you think yeah, of nasty. When you think of black America, you think of violence and gangs. Some yeah. people think rap and music and money, but others think violence and gangs and you know that. So when we raise our image as a community by coming together as a community, we will essentially undo that stereotype, which is founded in reality. A lot of the stereotype was made because something was observed that we did, and a lot of it was bad. We have to undo that. If we ever want to get anywhere in the world, if we ever want to be respected, if we ever want to come to a position in this earth where Africans can walk into an airport and walk past immigration without being looked at badly, without the baby, you know, you grab your child and bring them closer, without clinching yeah. your purse, when we want to get to that point, it will take a level of cooperation and communication and community that we don't currently have. That's later, much later at some point. So then the other question uh, is like, what are the lessons that you are actually you are planning to live in Tanzania? And what would you advise for people who actually wish to Tanzania? Okay. Lessons and uh, the things that we advise. advise. I've said some of the lessons, but for the sake of the question, I'll summarize. Yes, sir, yes, yes, sir. Perspective shift. The ability to shift your perspective in a way that makes it so that you're comfortable in particularly any situation, in just about any situation. That's a big lesson for me. It's the ability to change how you think. I thought I was pretty flexible-minded. Until you realize that you are Because I couldn't adjust how I saw things. I said the person who's lying to me is wrong. The person who's cheating me is wrong. The person who's trying to steal from me is wrong. The person who's hurting me is wrong. And most people would agree. If you try to take money out of my pocket, you're wrong. Now I say the person who's doing those things is hurting. That's a perspective shift. It's a powerful tool because it requires you to see things from another angle. If I looked at this desk from the front, I'd see a wall right here. But if I looked underneath, I'd see there's a hollow space here. But I have to physically move. So mentally, I have to move to get around certain issues, this desk being that issue, to understand it from another angle. The people are the same, the place is the same. It's hard for me to hate Tanzania. It's also hard for me to love it. I don't hate it, I don't love it. Now I see it, and as I see it, I can decide how I wanna feel actively. I can decide in every single moment, do I wanna be happy, do I wanna be sad, do I want? It gave me the ability to decide in real time how I wanna feel. That's powerful, man. Because now I don't have to react to things. I don't have to get angry at things. Well, I can just do things. Mm -hmm. And that's coming from a person who people describe as extremely reasonable. <laughs> Somebody made a comment on an old video of mine. They said, if Mark is such a reasonable person, if somebody made him mad, <laughs> he's got a problem. There's a real like problem. Yeah. But it had to, I had to expand even more. I had to expand my mind from here, which was already to a lot of people, really expanded to here, which is now more space for me to move around, space for me to shift how I see things. That's what it is. The most important lesson for me was how to shift how I see things. Instead of looking at it as this person is evil for doing me wrong, now I see it as that's a brother who's hurting. Because one requires me to see them as family. The other one requires me to see them as an enemy. I don't see enemies when I look down the street. I see a bunch of people who are lost and confused and hurt. I see the same with my people from America. 
Same with the Caribbean Islanders, some of them from the UK, some of them from Europe, I see it. But now I don't have to feel bad about what I see. I don't have to feel hurt about what I see because they're hurting. They've got enough hurt. They don't need me adding to it. Yeah. So now instead of yelling at them, oh, why'd you do that? And I'd be right to do it. I can say, no, you know, that person, mm, something ain't right. Let's dig a little deeper. Why are you doing it? You know, when you back up and you're not angry, you can you can really, really start to get an understanding. I had to go through a whole journey so that I could get an understanding. I'm glad I've got a bit of it now and I'm still learning every day, but that was one of my most important lessons that Tanzanian taught me. Okay, so thank you so much, you guys. I think you're a lot from my friend here, Mark. And I've really learned a lot of things from Mark here, and I'm really impressed uh, for such a person to have such a knowledge that he could share with you. And I hope I'll get another chance to have some interviews with him. So thank you so much. If you haven't seen this channel, I'm going to keep it down in the section, so check it. And until then, see you next time, and bye-bye. Thank you for having me.